Greetings, hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Liz. You can find me on Instagram as the Groucho Liz, and this is episode two of my knitting podcast, or knitting ish, crafting ish, whatever I want to talk about ish podcast. Thank you for watching this episode. Thank you for joining me on my crafting journey. And thank you also to the people who watched episode one and left comments for me. I will be putting a list of everything I talk about today in the description box down below. If you like what you see today, please like and subscribe. It would be brilliant to have you along on this journey. Before we start, I'm going to issue a disclaimer. I don't know exactly what's going to come out of my mouth. It could be swearing. It could be topics of an adult nature. Or it could just be complete and up to waffle. Proceed at your own caution. Last time I was talking about my stash enhancement and I talked about this ball of yarn from Cascade and I made the comment that Cascade aren't necessarily the most ethical of producers, I think was my exact words, and somebody asked me what I meant, which is a good question and a fair question. So this was a couple of years ago, um, one of the people involved with Cascade Yarns, Jean Durbin, had posted a, a tweet or a, I think it was a tweet or on Facebook both but had posted a post on social media uh, which was considered to be very homophobic that has now been deleted and the response from cascade was a oh, well she doesn't speak for us she's not part of the company um, but from memory jean was tweeting or posting from the official cascade sources i'm just not keen to support people who condone homophobic behavior so that is why generally I will not choose to use Cascade Yarn. I will also add, these are my opinions for me. I'm not going to tell other people what to think. I'm not going to tell other people how they choose to spend their money or where to choose their spend to spend their money. I'm not going to call for boycotts of any yarn brands or designers or people whose beliefs don't seem to fit in with mine. I am just making the decisions for me. And generally, Cascade is not a company I would choose to support, with the exception of this one ball of Christmas sock yarn. Before I talk about what I've been working on, I was going to share some things that I've been watching on the TV and reading. To start off reading list, which of course I have not got my books in my hand to show you. I have just finished this book called The Girls, which is about a pair of conjoined twins uh, craniophagus I think is the the word joined at the head so the story is basically about how the two of them are conjoined and can never be never be apart yet have never been able to look each other in the face and kind of about how they are intertwined but separate it's written as a diary mostly from Rose's point of view I think it is Two twins, Rose and Ruby, and I think it's Rose who does the majority of the writing. Um, but it's the story of the life of these these two girls as they grow up, as they go from being babies to young women. I have never looked into my sister's eyes. I've never bathed alone. I've never stood in the grass at night and raised my arms to a beguiling moon. I've never used an airplane bathroom or worn a hat or been kissed like that. I've never driven a car or slept through the night, never a private talk or solo walk. I've never climbed a tree or faded into a crowd. So many things I've never done, but oh, how I've been loved. And if such things were to be, I'd live a thousand lives as me to be loved so exponentially. My sister Ruby and I, by mishap or miracle, having intended to divide from a single fertilised egg, remain joined instead by a spot the size of a bread plate on, our, on the sides of our twin heads. We're known to the world medical community as the oldest surviving craniopagus twins. We are 29 years old. And to millions around the globe, those whose interest in people like us is more than just passing as conjoined craniopagus twins, Rose and Ruby Darlan of Baldoon County. We've been called many things. Freaks, horrors, monsters, devils, witches, retards, wonders, marvels. To most, we're a curiosity. In small town Leaford, where we live and work, we're just the girls so yeah definitely definitely recommend this book i've 
suggested it to my sister who doesn't read books in hard copy but she does listen to them as audio books so i am i am hoping that this is available on audible so that she can listen to it as well but yeah that's my recommendation the thing with my reading habits is that i tend to read non-fiction i i prefer non-fiction i get on better with non-fiction for some reason i don't know why so i am trying to up the, the amount of fiction books that i read so the next one on my list is this one. Um, I picked this up in a charity shop in December a couple of years ago, I think. Honestly, to be honest, I cannot remember which charity shop it was in, but it, it came from a charity shop. My aim was to start reading this in Black History Month last October, which shows how slowly I read books. Um, but this one, I... I had never heard of the Underground Railroad until I went to New York in 2018. And so once I'd found this book, I was like, actually, I want to learn a little bit more about it. So yeah, in 2018, I went to West Virginia for a planning meeting for the Will Scout Jamboree, which was held the following year. And since I was in the country, I spent a few days in Washington, DC, and then a few days in New York. But a friend of mine suggested that I go to the Girl Scout shop in New York, which I did and was well worth doing, very definitely well worth doing. I bought badges. There was there was an exhibition of um, vintage Girl Scout things. But one of the things I did find there was these. So this is a, a pair of scarves with a bingo of things to do in New York, one of which is visit a stop on the Underground Railroad. So that was how I found out about the Underground Railroad. That's That was my first introduction to it. And actually this whole bingo list of things gave me a really good structure of things to do whilst I was in New York. So thank you, Girl Scouts. I have one finished object, which are these socks. It's taken me slightly longer than I wanted to because of all sorts of problems I'm having, which I'll talk about in a second. But they are done. They are the first pair of festive socks I have knit for my festive box of socks. The yarn is West Yorkshire Spinners in the colourway Hollyberry. The contrast toes, cuffs and heels are in a Mayflower number no. one yarn in a colourway unknown which I bought from the Hobby website, and the pattern is Fairy Lights by Winnick Mum. So last time I was full of glee, full of pride that I had managed to weave in all of my ends and so that when I finished the sock it would be almost done and it was amazing and wonderful. I tried to graft the ends using the Finchley graft, which I was told by the videos was much easier than Kitchener Stitch, and it went badly wrong not a little bit wrong it went really really badly wrong so I had to cut off the toe I can't, I can't remember which toe it was but yes cut off the toe unravel I think I did I picked up a whole load of stitches about here along where the green stripe is cut off the toe here I had to unravel all of the ends that had been woven in both from the toe and from the body of the sock and yeah, unravel it all, pick up all of the missed stitches and then knit it back up to the edge of the toe before re-knitting the toe. This is not something I want to do again. It was a faff. It's, it's possible, but it was one of those things that it's just frustrating. So yeah, re-knitted toe. Um, and after trying to do that, I thought, that's all right. What I'll do is I'll try the Russian join because that looks even easier. That's how that one turned out. So I tried the Russian join. It went wrong somehow. Um, and when I pulled this out of my knitting bag a couple of days ago, I found that the stitches were off the needle. No idea why. So... This one, which is my 
whip, one of my whips, I've gone through, picked up the stitches with embroidery thread. At some point I will go through the fiddly process of putting them all back on the needle and working out where all of the decreases are before seaming them up. However, after having two mess ups of sewing up the ends of a pair of socks, I then thought, why don't I just learn how to do grafting? Proper kitchener stitch. And I have. So this is my first one which is admittedly not perfect, but at a first attempt, that's pretty good. Um, and what I'm planning to do is when I sew up the end, weave in the end, I'm going to weave it across that seam just to strengthen up the seam. And this one is attempt two, which as far as I'm concerned is almost perfect. So yes, one finished item. These ones, so very nearly finished. They haven't been completed at the end, so I am still going to have to class them as works in progress but they are sewn in at the end these are again the fairy lights socks pattern and the yarn is regia perfect by Anna and carlos in the colorway garden and these are going to be the second one of my christmas socks when they're finished but very nearly very nearly there now if two failed attempts at grafting the toes or closing the toes wasn't enough I also had an incident, oh, I can't remember, a week ago, two weeks ago, where I saw my knitting bag on the floor and I thought, that knitting needle should not be poking out through my knitting, through the bag. That knitting needle should not be that angle. So yeah, I was able to straighten it just about um, to the point that I can't, I haven't noticed which one it is, but yay, <laughs> bent knitting needle to add to the fun. And then these are my current socks um, in progress. I wanted, basically I wanted a pair of socks to cast on during Joe Biden's inauguration as a way of marking the event. And these are the ones. Now, last week I think it was, I was awake at two o'clock in the morning and I'd done the heel flap and I was like, fantastic, I'm going to pick up for the gusset. I'd forgotten to turn the heels. So after picking up all of the stitches and knitting about half a round, I then had to unpick all of the stitches. This morning I tried turning the heel and it went wrong. I ended up with all of the heel stitches used on one side and about three or four left over on the other side. So I had to pull it all out again. I'm getting a bit bored of knitting socks. Um, this one, I mean, the only saving grace for this sock, it, when I unpicked all the, the heels, somehow I've increased by one stitch. So when I started knitting across that, or purling across that way, I knit two stitches together at the beginning of the row. So as I was tinking it all back, at the point I got to the two stitches that knit together at the end of the row, I knew I was at the last line or last row of knitting for the heel turn. So again, it's not impossible to undo things and start again. That's one of the joys of knitting, but it is so frustrating. Please make me feel better. What what woes, knitting woes do you have? What mistakes have you made? Please put them down in the comments below. Make me feel a little bit better about all my mess ups. This yarn is paint box yarns, sock yarn, and it's a zebra colorway. So they have four different styles of designs. There's the, I think stripes, fair isle, mosaic, and zebra. This is one of the zebra patterns. I've tried to do contrasting cuffs um, to make it clear that these two are a pair, even if the zebra pattern won't quite match up. Um, and then I'll be doing possibly contrasting toes at the end. I, I'll make that decision when I get there. Now, the last thing I have been knitting, which is knitting adjacent rather than knitting directly, are bead markers and earrings. Back in 2018, at the very first Woolen Dublin, I bought this from Ankoitenberg, I think is how it's pronounced. 
um, it's Irish Gaelic, which means the little cat. For a long time, I thought that was the name of the designer and the person who made the company, and I thought her name was Caitlin. No, it's not. Uh, but this is a stitch marker set. And finally, I have got around to using some of it. Now, many years ago, on the front of some magazine, they had a set of stitch markers in pink and green, which I did not like. Um, they were in sets of three like that. So basically, I pulled apart those stitch markers and used the head pins for, I'm trying to do this without dropping them all over the floor. These are the two bead markers I made. And yeah, my phone does not like focusing. Um, the yellow one was just, I like the colour yellow. It was a bright colour to brighten up a February day. The silver one here, this is actually a bead, dice bead, which I got in my Christmas cracker last year. So those are both going to go into my stitch marker tin. And these are the other pair of stitch markers I made. Again, yellow beads because they're nice and bright and colourful. Um, only I made them with gold fittings, mostly to see what it was like what the contrast was between gold and silver fittings. And if that wasn't enough, I also made these earrings. So these were beads from the stitch marker set, which have got a really nice marbled um, effect on them. So I thought these were nice, relatively neutral earrings. The other thing I found this morning from perusing through YouTube is a talk about knitting, knitting patterns in the 1920s and 1930s, which was hosted by the London School of Economics Library. It was a talk given by a lady, I think her first name is Ellie, she is a doctor, Dr Ellie, who works in the English department of a university. See, I wasn't paying much attention to that, but I was more focused on the knitting. Um, but she who was doing a project about women's magazines in the interwar years, found out that a large number of them contained knitting patterns. And because she herself was a keen knitter, wanted to explore that further. So she, her talk was about the knitting patterns that happened in the interwar years. And there was some mention of the 1910s and... Um, how crochet was a big part of magazines in the 1910s but then she talked about how the knitting patterns were used to sell the magazine to um, particular groups of people women mostly um, how the knitting patterns offered women on a lower income that taste of glamour and taste of luxury when they were able to knit themselves jumpers like like Hollywood stars were wearing and I thought it was a really interesting talk. I will put the link again down below. But one of the reasons why I am particularly fascinated with knitting history is that it's it's not so much a history of the craft, but a social history of the crafters. But it's, I just find it kind of fascinating seeing how the knitting practices of the time reflect the politics and the culture and the society. Now, one of the books mentioned in the talk is this one, Knitting for Tommy um, by Lucinda Gosling, which was published a few years ago. I got it as a birthday present. Um, but it is about First World War. Men were being sent off to the trenches and women back at home were encouraged to knit. So knitting socks, knitting um, mufflers, hats, balaclavas, gaiters, sort of, I think things that went under the boots over the, I'm not entirely sure where they went, but the, almost like leg warmers with stirrups. If you can imagine a pair of leg warmers with a stirrup at the bottom, that's kind of the thing they were making. And that apparently um, caused a great big upsurge in people knitting, a great big interest in knitting because everybody wanted to do their bit. And if you think this was, you know, the height of the height of the British Empire, but, you know, the, Britain still had its empire. 
So people across the empire were showing how patriotic they were in knitting socks for soldiers. There is a lot in the book. Obviously, I can't go through and mention every single thing because copyright issues. But what I will share is from this book. Cover of this book is shown with the poem on the front. For the empire and for freedom, we all must do our bit. The men go forth to battle, the women wait and knit. But yes, this is one example of how the knitting culture really reflected the time and the society in which the knitting took place. I have read this before. I think, to be honest, it's time I reread it because um, there's a lot of stuff in there that I forgot was there. But there's pictures of patterns, um, pictures of how knitting had become part of the popular culture, music hall song sheets that were released, which had pictures of people knitting or balls of yarn, um, postcards with pictures of people knitting, um, the stories of soldiers who had been wounded and were convalescing, who were encouraged to knit. Um, yeah, really good book, really full of fascinating information about that particular period in history. I've also been watching quite a lot of television, probably more than I should, but you know, I'm at home for most of the day. Television is a good distraction other than knitting and knitting mistakes. Uh, but the thing that has really grabbed me and has grabbed quite a few of my friends as well is It's a Sin, which is by Russell T Davies. It's a drama about the AIDS crisis. And it is the first British television drama which uh, deals with it. Now, Russell T Davies is a gay man. He was in his 20s at the beginning of the 80s. He saw the crisis as it happened. Um, so what he has written is based on people he knew, stories he knows of at the time, um, things that really happened. And I think for me, that is what makes it so heartbreaking is that it's not just a well-written story, it's a well-written story about real people. But watching it and knowing that, although the characters on the TV are pretend and made up, they all represent real people who died far too young, who represent grieving families, who represent, you know, families who are angry and confused and... Um, feel shame i was mm, under 10 when the AIDS, AIDS crisis all kicked off i remember the don't die of ignorance advert that was broadcast here in the uk but i wasn't really aware of the rest of it um i wasn't aware of people and burials happening late at night or cremations happening late at night where nobody knew about them i didn't really understand the extent of families lying about why the men in their families had died lots of lots of men were um the official cause of death or the cause of death told by the family were pneumonia or cancer when those were things caused by having aids I didn't realise quite the number of people who died that, you know, if, you, if you're if you going to funerals, you'd be going to one or two funerals a week, potentially. So although I am sort of aware of what happened, there is a lot there that I've learned. But yeah, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Stephen Fry is in there as a perfectly tuned Tory MP kind of highlighting the hypocrisy at the time there is a lot of fun a lot of laughs a lot of joy amongst the characters and the lives they're living um but as you might imagine it doesn't end well for all of the characters but i would absolutely recommend it if you're in the uk the it's been shown on tv the last episode is friday of this week it's all available on more four and i believe it is coming to america at some point either later this year or next year i think it's at some point later this year it is coming to america i don't know further details than that um but yes if you can get your hands on it i absolutely recommend it it's amazing so yes that's a roundup of what i have been doing over the last month or so 
I had hoped to do a recording a couple of weeks ago. However, a combination of stuff going wrong and not really having anything to show for it, combined with general life admin, um, meant that it was slightly delayed. You know, if the options are recording a video or doing the laundry, recording a video or doing the dishes, recording a video or going grocery shopping, practicalities will always win out, um, rather unfortunately. So here we go. Here is on to the next month where I hope there will be more crafting, fewer practicalities, and I hope to see you next time. Cheerio. Thank you.